I just want to say good evening to everyone. My name is Tequila Barnes Hall. I'm with College Foundation of North Carolina. And you're here to find out some really good information line by line about completing the FAFSA. So this is our final webinar for this semester as part of our uh, college kickoff series. So we have an amazing uh, guest speaker who will be speaking to you today. And I'll introduce her in just a few moments. Uh, but I just wanna go over some housekeeping rules before we begin our webinar. So as a participant, you will be in listen-only mode and that's so that we can have a wonderful experience. And I also want to let you know is that we are asking that all of you are appropriate while we're a part of the webinar. So that means via your camera, via chat, uh, when you're unmuted during the Q&A, uh, we are asking that you're um, on your best behavior and not doing anything that's inappropriate. And so of course, anything that's inappropriate will not be tolerated for this webinar. And if someone should do something that's inappropriate, we will have to uh, actually remove you from the webinar. So I don't think we will have a problem with that tonight, but I just wanna make sure that we understand webinar etiquette. We have several people who work collaboratively together. Uh, we have several people who have worked together collaboratively to make uh, this webinar series possible. And I just want to make sure that we're acknowledging those groups. So again, uh, I'm Tequila Barnes Hall. I'm with College Foundation of North Carolina. We also have Guilford County Schools, Guilford County Parent Academy. And I'm gonna ask the other individuals that are part of this collaboration to introduce themselves before we introduce our speaker. All right, well, hi everyone. I'm Warshay Downey from Say Yes Guilford, Senior Director of Data and Post-Secondary Success. And uh, we're glad to have you tonight. And Brandy is also on the line. She's our assistant director of um, outreach. So we're glad to have her on the line as well. College advisors. Hi everyone, I'm Miss Lutz. I'm a college advisor at High Point Central. And we also have some other advisors with us tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and popcorn it to Desire from Dudley. Y'all see me? Hi, everyone. My name is Miss Spurgeon. I am the college advisor at Dudley High School. Hi, I'm Mr. Adams. I'm the college advisor at Smith High School. And I just want to say thank you so much for all of our uh, agencies that have helped make this webinar possible. But I want to introduce you to a very special guest. We have Lisa Kortoff. She is the director of financial aid for Guilford. Technical Community College, and she will be facilitating our webinar for this evening. We are going to ask that you um, hold all of your questions until the very end, so you can put your information or your questions in the chat when the uh, webinar is done, or we will allow you to unmute um, yourself at the very end. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's your time, Lisa. Thank you so much for being our speaker this evening. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, it's, ni it's nice to be here with all of you. And, and I hope as we go through the FAFSA line by line, if you have questions, that uh, we're probably going to answer most of them as we go through this. We're going to go, like, I, like we've said, line by line through the FAFSA. And I think most of questions will be answered. But if not, please save those to the end. We'll have some time uh, to answer your questions about the FAFSA and about the financial aid process. Hopefully make you feel a little bit better about it and a little less nervous about it. Um, I've been doing this for 33 years and I can attest to you that the FAFSA is actually a lot easier than it used to be. And you will find that when you do the FAFSA online, it's fairly intuitive uh, in that depending on how you answer questions, you will only see the next questions if it pertains to you. So when folks try to scare you by saying it's, ooh, it's a long application and it's, you know, it's kind of scary, uh, it's really not anymore because you'll only see the parts that, are, uh, that apply to you. And that didn't used to be the case. So uh, I think you'll find that this is pretty easy going. Before we get too far into it, uh, I do want to mention um, that one of the most important things you can do before you start the FAFSA is to, go, is to obtain an FSA ID. What, what is that? Well, an FSA ID, FSA stands for the Federal Student Aid, and it, the ID is a way for you to electronically sign in and to sign your FAFSA. And I'm also making the assumption tonight that I'm speaking with students and parents, which makes you a, uh, makes them dependent. 
so both a student and a parent will be required to file this FAFSA if the student is dependent. And we'll talk more about that as we get into it. So get your FSA ID first. The FSA ID is obtained on a website called fsaid.ed.gov. And it will ask you some questions, your name, your social security number, and um, an email address. And it will then assign you an ID that you will use to sign the FAFSA. And this, this will make more sense as we get into the FAFSA, but I would work on obtaining that first before you start the actual FAFSA. That way you're ready to go to, up, you know, to pull up your information and to sign it at the end. Uh, a couple of tips about the FSA ID. Don't, don't, it's not a trivial thing. Don't blow it off. Um, be very careful in completing it. One of the best things I can advise you to do is to make sure that when you're completing it for the student and a separate one for the parent, that there be two different uh, email addresses used. If your child uh, doesn't have their own email address, now is a great time to get them one uh, if they don't have it. But make sure you're using two separate email addresses to uh, prevent any problems down the road. So get that done first. And then once you have that, then you're ready to jump into the FAFSA. We're gonna hear, go over some key features here of the FAFSA. Uh, again, it's at fafsa.gov, F-A-F-S-A.gov. And uh, another thing I'll mention is we're gonna make the assumption that you are applying for the 21-22 school year, which begins next fall. So a year from now. If in fact you are gonna be starting school before then, if you're going to go to college in the spring or in the summer, then you'll need to complete the 2020-21 application. And so be careful about choosing your years. Uh, so the application cycle for the 21-22 year just started last month. It started back October 1, and it's gonna last all the way through June 30th of 2022 for the 21-22 school year. So that's a long time to apply. Uh, that's great, but the answer uh, I'm gonna give you on when should I do it is now. Don't wait. Uh, you should try to get your FAFSA done as early as possible, and now is a great time to do it. So thanks for joining us again tonight so you can learn how to do it. Uh, we're going to go over these key features of the, FA of the FAFSA one by one. Uh, one of the things that's usually one of the scariest parts of the FAFSA is the tax return and uh, pulling in income information from it. Uh, the good news is that you can actually link up with the IRS in this, in this uh, application and pull that information into your FAFSA so that you don't have to try to figure out what information to put on there. Uh, it has made life a lot easier for everyone. So hopefully you'll use this feature. And again, we will talk more about that. Another cool feature is that if you have, if this, I'm talking to the parents here now, if you have multiple students in college, you can knock them all out at one time because once you complete that first application from one of your college students, it's gonna ask you whether or not you, there, that student has any of brothers and sisters in college that need to have a FAFSA completed. And if you say yes, then it pre-populates that second or third FAFSA or however many kids you have in college. Uh, and it does a lot of the work for you, which is pretty awesome. Uh, you're gonna be able to uh, list up to 10 schools on your FAFSA and, uh, and this is free. There's no, there's no cost to send your information to more than one school. If you're trying to make decisions for next fall, you may have it very firmly in your mind that you're definitely going to one school and you're not looking at any others. But I have learned through experience, it's always good to have some backup. And uh, if you haven't considered putting GTCC on your FAFSA, that's always a good idea because you might come and see us because uh, we're a pretty awesome school. Got to put in that quick little plug for GTCC, of course. Uh, You'll be able to, once you've submitted your FAFSA, if you realize you've made a mistake or some information needs to be updated, you can go back afterwards. And you do have the ability, if you're in the middle of your FAFSA, to save it. If you can't finish it, maybe you get started on tonight and, and uh, you know something comes on like flip or flop on AG, HGTV tonight or something and you want to put it aside, that's not a problem. You can save it and come back to it. All right, so let's look what this home view looks like for the FAFSA. When you go to fafsa.gov, this is gonna be your very first slide and you'll see you'll have options here. It's a two button option to log in. Either you're gonna be new to the FAFSA process. And when I say new, 
uh, this is for the student, not the parent, because uh, some parents out there are students too. Uh, but this is about the child going to college that we're talking about right now. Um, or if this is someone who has already done a FAFSA in previous years and is coming back to it, they would be considered a returning user if they're coming back for a subsequent year or if they're coming back to make a correction. So they talk here a little bit about FAFSA deadlines. I can tell you for the state of North Carolina, we don't have a FAFSA deadline. Uh, we also don't have a state aid deadline. Uh, however, uh, funds are limited. So completing this as early as possible puts you in the running for as much financial aid as there is available. And we're talking about the free money. So it is to your benefit to do this early. Uh, I'm gonna say that several times through today, tonight's presentation. All right, and then you'll come to another home view here where it talks about, uh, it gives you a little navigation features uh, about completing the form, uh, finding FAFSA help. You might find that when you're in the middle of the FAFSA, you have questions about whether you should report this type of thing or how to report a certain thing on the FAFSA. And this, this FAFSA help, help is really, really good. Um, and it gives you options then to renew your form for subsequent years. All right, so first, this is where you're gonna log in. And again, this is where they're gonna find out whether the person who's filling this out right now is the student themselves or the parent. So you can choose either one. I would recommend uh, that the student be involved in this process uh, from the very beginning. Uh, these folks, uh, these kids are going to college and they're going to have to do a lot of things on their own. And this is a great place to start is to have them work with you Perhaps you sit there hip to hip and fill out that FAFSA together, uh, but have them sign in as the student. Uh, but that being said, if you can't, uh, or the timing's not right, or you need to go back in and look at your information, you can log in as the parent and review and uh, submit information as well. So choose the one that's appropriate here. All right, so we're gonna choose uh, to say that I am the student. So this is what it's going to look like. It's going to ask you the information from that FSA ID setup that I mentioned earlier. So you're going to create a username or you can use your email address for the student or um, the telephone number and then a password that you created during the FSA ID setup process. This will launch things off for you. All right, and this is what the screen will look like if in fact you're the parent that's logging in. And you can see it looks a little bit different. It wants the student's name, not your name, the parent, but the student's name uh, and their social security number and their date of birth in order to get logged in. Once you get there, you get just a little disclaimer about that you're using a federal government website. So be careful, right? And now it's time to get started. So it, this is where you get to choose that school year. And again, we're assuming tonight that you're filling out the 21-22 uh, application for next fall. Uh, but again, if you need one for this coming spring or summer, that would be the 2021. So be careful when you choose this year. Every year we'll have a student who swears that they did their FAFSA. And in fact, they did, but we discovered it was for the wrong year. So. Uh, just choose it the right one from the very beginning and it'll save you hours of heartache. The other thing you can do is I mentioned that once you get into the middle of this, if you need to save it and maybe leave or go watch a TV show or go get some groceries, uh, you can save this in the middle of it and come back to it. So this is where you get to create your own little save key. Uh, just a short little, uh, you can use like four digits if you want to, just to set, create a save key, it's just something really short. Um, and then you can pop right back in where you left off uh, if you have to leave in the middle of doing your FAFSA. Now they do save it for up to 45 days. Uh, hopefully you would not wait that long, but uh, after 45 days, then basically you'd have to go in a different way. All right. So here we've got the introduction. This is, this is some what they call an accordion view. You can click on these different topics um, to get information. Uh, about you know how many steps is there, you know how long is this whole process going to take? Those types of answers will be found here, and how to sign and all that kind of good stuff. So you can read more about that. All right, 
As I mentioned before, we are going to assume tonight that this is the traditional college student who's completing the FAFSA with their parents because they are considered a dependent student. And the very first slide will ask the student's information. Uh, again, the social security number will already be filled in because that was derived from the FSA ID login that you use to, to access the application. Uh, it's gonna ask you to fill out the name, date of birth, and go to the next screen. And it's gonna ask for your email, your telephone number. And again, keep in mind, please, that this section is the student, not the parent that it's referencing. If you ever get lost in the middle of this, just look at the top of the screen. You'll see where you are in the process. And right now we are under the student demographics section. So again, these questions are about the student and not the parent. Parent, we will get to you soon. It's gonna ask for your address. It's going to ask if you've lived in your state for at least five years. And if you are a US citizen or an eligible non-citizen or uh, not a citizen at all, there's a drop down box. You'll see the little arrow on the right hand side that'll guide you through which question or how to answer this question, whichever is appropriate to the student. All right, it's gonna ask the student if they are gonna, uh, when they begin the 2021 school year, if they are a high school, gonna be a high school graduate. So if you plan to graduate this next May or June, you would say yes to this question, say you have a high school diploma. And um, it's also gonna ask you then what you're gonna be working on in college uh, for the, uh, when you go in the 2021 school year. So for many of you, it might be your first bachelor's degree or it might be a two year degree. But again, there is a drop down box where you get to choose uh, what the student's status will be for their year in college in 2021. It's gonna ask you if you've already have a bachelor's degree, um, which at this point, if we're talking about our traditional college student, the answer is no. And then it's gonna ask you about your college grade level. If the child has never been to college before, then the answer is never attended college. I point this out specifically because there is, if you do the drop down box, several, several things to choose from. And one of them says graduate student. And invariably every year we'll get a student who will mark that because they will say, I am a high school graduate. But that is not what it's referring to. It's referring to a student who's working on a master's degree, not a high school graduate. So be sure to choose the right year there because once you've earned a bachelor's degree or you're in graduate school, you're no longer eligible for most federal grant programs. So by answering that question wrong, you might temporarily put yourself out of the running for that. So be careful. And then it's gonna ask if, you're el if the student is eligible, uh, interested in being considered for federal work study. Work study is a really great program where a student can work on campus and sometimes off in a community service setting to earn a portion of their financial aid package. Great way to get uh, job experience and to put something on the resume when you're getting closer to graduation and you're looking for that job. Uh, so it's a great uh, program and you can answer this as yes, no, or don't know. And this is one of those things you can always go back in and change. Just answering yes does not obligate the student to take a, a, a job. It just puts them in the running to be invited. I'm gonna ask about the gender of the student. And it's going to ask if you are registered with Selective Service. Uh, this, uh, this is for the gentleman in the, in the audience tonight. Uh, gentlemen between the ages of uh, 18 and 25 do need to requ are re required to register with Selective Service. Uh, this is not putting you in the military, but it is putting you into the pool of people who would be considered for call up if in fact there was a mandatory draft. Um, you are required to be registered if you are a male and between the ages of 18 and 25 in order to get financial aid. So if you're not registered, you can use this opportunity right there in the next question to have the Department of Education register you for that. Uh, if the student is not yet 18, that's okay. You can mark no, and that won't be required for the first year, but it will be required for subsequent years. So it's a good idea just to get registered as soon as you turn 18 so that that never becomes a problem for you. It's gonna ask whether or not you have a driver's license and what the 
a state that is issued from. It's going to ask if the student is a foster youth or were they at any time in the foster care system. Uh, mark this box just so that we can provide you some additional information about special aid available in North Carolina for students who were in the foster care program. It's going to ask about the high school uh, of parent number one. Uh, and for some folks, there is going to be just the one parent, uh, but it's going to ask what their highest school completed was and uh, the high school completed um, for parent number two. Again, if you only have the one parent, you only have to answer the one question. Now back to the student and high school. It's going to ask the student what high school they are going to or did go to. And it's what you do is you put in the name of your high school. I would try to put as few information as you can in here. Uh, don't try to get the name exact. Uh, try to get some, maybe put in some keywords like if you're going to, let's say, Northeast Guilford High School, uh, you might put in just Guilford and then put in the city and the state. And keep in mind, Northeast Guilford, I believe, is in Gibsonville or McLeansville um, and put the correct city in there and then do a search. And it'll give you all the options to choose from. Uh, all your high schools here in Guilford County are listed there. So it's just a matter of being careful of how you look it up. Don't put too much information in there or it's going to be too specific to, to do the search effectively. All right. And so here's an example if you were to put in the like they this person put in West as just their their search criteria and they found 31 results. This is actually better than being too specific. Like I mentioned here, once you see which high school you go to, you pick the one you need just by clicking the select box to the left and then going to next. And then here's the searches for colleges. This is where you're gonna list what college you want to receive your information. Uh, again, you can list up to 10. If you actually have more than 10, you would list the initial 10 this time around and then go back and make a correction later if you need to add more colleges. But on this initial timeout, you can list up to 10. And I actually have seen someone list up to 10 and that's okay, leave your options open, right? Still early. And that search function is gonna act very similar to what the high school search function was. Uh, again, for example, if you were searching for Guilford Technical Community College in Greensboro, you won't find it. Uh, in this case, you'd wanna put in Guilford Technical and then just the state because we're actually in Jamestown. So you won't find it in Greensboro. So you're gonna, you might be confused or you might get a, re a reply back that shows Guilford College, which is another fine college here in town, but it's not GTCC. So be careful about what you select. It's gonna also ask about the housing plans for the student when they're going to college. Uh, this is actually a fairly important question. It's gonna ask whether or not the student will be living on campus, if they're gonna be living with parents or if they're gonna live on their own. Uh, the answer to this question often determines what the cost of education is for the student, because as you know, there's a cost for living on campus, and there certainly is a cost if you were to live on your own. It would be more than if you were living with your parents, and that's all taken into account in the actual application uh, process in determining the amount of aid. So uh, be, be as accurate as you can with this answer knowing that in fact, if your situation does change, you can always come back here and make a correction. All right, and we talked about choosing the housing. All right, now it's gonna ask about what is your marital status as of today? Now, again, this is the student. I think most of you, if you're dependent, you're, you're single. Um, and so that's the first question. This is not the parent's question about marital status. We'll get to yours in a little bit. So this is about the student. Uh, if you use the little drop-down box, you'll see that there's, there's several um, uh, options to choose from, single, uh, married, divorced, separated, that kind of thing. If you'll notice too, uh, I didn't mention it on the last one, but we've the, if you look at the tab at the top, we've now moved on to the next section. We have moved off the school selection section and we've now moved into dependency status. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we were going to assume that the students um, who are applying tonight is, that are listening to this uh, workshop are dependent. 
the answer to these questions establishes whether or not a student is considered independent or dependent. So these are fairly important questions. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about each one of them. Uh, the first one asks whether or not the student, and again, not the parent, but the student, whether the student themselves have children that they support more than 50%. Um, if, if in fact your college going student uh, does have children that they support, then they would answer yes to this question. Uh, but be careful, again, this one asks whether or not they're providing more than 50% of the support. So if you have your college going uh, child at home and they have a child and they're living with you and you're providing all the rent and the room board, then they don't themselves have a dependent, you have a dependent. So they would answer no in that case. But if in fact they are supporting that child more than 50%, you would answer yes. And that's also say, the same with the next question. Do you have dependents other than children or a spouse that you're providing more than 50% of their support? And they would also have to be living with you if that were the case. I know for most of the folks that I'm talking to tonight, the answer to these two questions is gonna be no, but there are some exceptions. So I just wanna make sure I mention those. Here's some more questions to determine whether or not a student is considered dependent. They've consulted pretty nicely into this one, whereas if, if the answer is no to all these, just check the final box at the bottom where it says none of the above. And again, for most of our audience tonight, the answer is going to be none of the above. But there are some other ways that students can be considered an independent student if they mark these boxes. Um, if they're on active duty with the military, if they're a veteran of the armed services, if they were uh, in foster care or both of their parents were deceased after the age of 13, um, if they were considered an emancipated minor, and that's something where you actually have to go to court to become an emancipated minor. It's not just a declaration. But, um, and then if someone other than a parent or a step parent has legal guardianship, uh, be careful of this one. There is a difference between legal guardianship and legal custody. Most of the agreements in North Carolina say legal custody. And if that is the case, you would not mark this box. You would only mark this box if someone other than the parent or the step parent as legal guardianship. And so that word would need to be in any legal court documents that you have. Please be aware that your answers to these questions will be checked by the College Financial Aid Office. And oftentimes documentation is required to prove that the answers to these questions are correct. Because it is so easy to mark these wrong, uh, we often ask for proof of that. And if, uh, if it's a mistake, it's easy enough to correct but we wanna make sure we've got the right answers. So be careful with this page. And then the last question about dependency status, I believe this is the last one. It asks whether or not you were homeless or if you were um, self-supporting and at risk of being homeless. Uh, if you have any questions about that, it's really good to talk to either your high school counselor um, or to talk to the college financial aid office to be sure of the answer to this. This can be a little bit tricky. Um, so if you have questions about whether or not you're considered homeless or at risk of being homeless, uh, please talk with one, one of us and we can help you answer this question. Again, for most students, the answer is no, but it, there, are, uh, there are situations where the answer would be yes. So I just wanna give you some direction on where to go to get more answers about that. All right, so now we get to a point where if, if you answered no to all those questions about being a D about the dependency, it means that you're a dependent student. And that means that you will include your parents' information on your FAFSA in addition to your own. Um, however, there are gonna be certain situations where even though you've answered no to all those questions about whether or not you're an independent student or a dependent student, there are special situations that can be considered where we can treat you as an independent. Um, these are typically, you know, there's situations where maybe the student cannot or should not have contact with their parents. If you have any questions about whether or not you qualify for this, you can certainly talk to your high school counselor or to the financial aid officer like myself and we can help you with this. But if you think you might qualify under this, and this again, we're talking to the student here, uh, then you would say, I'm unable to provide information about my parent. And then that section would not be 
completed. And that's the next section we're going into here in a moment. Uh, but you wanna be, if you do mark that, just be aware that you're gonna have to follow up with your college financial aid office because they're gonna ask you to fill out some paperwork and provide documentation about why you cannot provide your parents' information. Um, otherwise, you would answer, yes, I will provide my parents' information and we're gonna to go to that section now. All right, so this is the first page of the parents' information and this is the demographic section. Uh, this is where we're gonna ask information about the parents and you're gonna notice the, uh, the, the use of the terms parent one and parent two. For a lot of folks that is gonna be mother and father, father and mother, you can use them interchangeably, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but we don't, we don't uh, say whether it's mother or father because it could be mother and mother and father or father uh, or father and stepmother and stepfather and, and mother. There's a lot of things that could be said here. So we, instead the terms parent one and parent two are used. So be aware of what they're talking about here. And the very first question is if you do have two parents, what is their marital status? And again, there's a drop down box there where you can choose from that, but uh, you'll see here we've assumed that they are married. And then they ask what, what month and what year were they married or remarried? If this is a case where you're a parent um, and you are no longer married to your child's natural father, but you have remarried, for example, and there is a stepfather, uh, you would use the date of your remarriage because you will be using that step parent's information on this form. And so it's asking about the marital status of that marriage, not the, not the natural parent of the student. So, all right, it's gonna ask some more information about the parents here. Uh, this is about the first parent or parent one. Um, and it's gonna ask for the social security number, their last name, the first initial of their name, I'll mention here briefly here, uh, be careful to use the name that's listed on your social security card. Um, some folks, you know, use a nickname for a first name or maybe they never, they forgot to change their last name on their social security card and they go by another name now. Use the name that's on the social security card to prevent any problems with your FAFSA because if you can't match it, then you'll have to provide some kind of documentation to the financial aid office about why it doesn't match. It's gonna ask about the parent's date of birth, the parent's email address, and then just ask it to re-enter it just to confirm it. All right, and so here's the information about the second parent, parent number two. Uh, again, social, name, uh, date of birth. Go to next. And they're gonna ask if the parent is a resident of the state that was reported on the FAFSA for at least five years. So that's either yes or no, very simple. All right, household size. Now what you'll do when you get here is you'll find out that a lot of this stuff might already be filled out, but you need to, you need to keep an eye on it and, and make sure you answer the questions. For example, in this case, um, the, there was only one parent, uh, excuse me, there's two parents listed and so it's already assumed that for your parents under household size that the answer is two. Um, for, then you always count yourself. That's the number one there that you see. And then below that, it's going to ask to fill out uh, any other household size members. So it asks about whether or not there's any other, um, if the parents provide more than 50% of the support to any other children, whether they live with them or not, or whether or not those children would be dependent students for financial aid purposes. And that goes back to those same questions that we talked about earlier. And then they would include other people here if they are now living with them and providing more than 50% of their support. That could be like a, a grandmother or maybe a, an aunt lives with, with your, in your family, in your household. So you can count them if they meet this criteria. And then it's gonna ask for the number in college. Uh, keep in mind that this would be the student and any other dependents that li are living at home in the household uh, or outside the household that are considered dependent as the number in college. The parents cannot count themselves in this number if they are going to college. Uh, so be sure to answer this one correctly. And then it's going to ask you about the parents' tax information. 
Uh, this is for the 21-22 school year. It is asking about your 2019 information. So this was from last year. This would have been the tax form that you filed earlier this year. Uh, it would have been for the 2019 year. So that's the income that's gonna be asked about on here. It's gonna ask whether or not it's already been completed. And certainly by this time, it should have been completed, I think in most cases. So the answer should be already completed. And that's assuming you did file taxes. Uh, there are folks who uh, don't file taxes because their income is at a level that doesn't require them to file. Uh, if that's the case, you'll see when you do the drop down box there that you have the option of putting do not file or did not file. It's going to ask them what type of tax return they filed. And again, there's a drop down box from that. Most people are going to say that they filed an IRS 1040. And then it's going to ask for the filing status that was used on the tax return. Um, you know, it could be single, married filing jointly, married filing separately, head of household. But you'll have a drop down box there that you can choose the correct status. And you can see for the for our example tonight, it's the married filing joint return. Now here it gets to the good part. Um, you get to, if you if you filed uh, your tax return with the IRS, you can click on this link to IRS, and it's going to take you to another page that will actually take you off the site. It will go out to the irs.gov website. It's going to ask you information uh, about uh, you, and you should use the information when it asks about your name and your address and your social security number. Uh, use the information that was provided on your 2019 tax return. Be really careful when entering your address. Uh, it's very picky. So if you put down that you live at 123 Main Street and you filled out S-T-R-E-E-T -E -E Street on your tax return, you will also want to do this for your link up with the IRS. Once it confirms, because you've entered this information that you are who you are, and, and again, we're talking about the student here, keep that in mind, or excuse me, the parent here. So use the parent information when you're retrieving it. Uh, then it's going to pull that information over automatically. It's going to walk you through how to pull that information and then put you right back into the FAFSA, right where you left off. And you're going to skip all the hard questions about where to find the income information on your taxes. Now, that being said, there are some people who cannot use the IRS uh, link up. For example, a really common example is in the 2019 year, you filed married filing jointly. But since that time, you are now separated from your spouse. And you reported that on the FAFSA that you are now separated from your spouse. You're not gonna be able to use this link because your marital status won't match. It, it, it would try to pull over all the information that's on your tax return when in fact, you only want the portion that is the, yours, the parents, the, the one who is filling out this FAFSA. So there are some exceptions and there are just, I mean, I'll admit sometimes there's just some wiggy things that happen in that link that just for whatever reason, it can't find your record in the IRS website. Uh, that's not the end of the world. It's totally fine. Uh, you can still fill out that information from a copy of your tax return that you should have in your files. And we'll go through that section now. Okay, so this is where it's gonna ask if you weren't able to use the IRS data retrieval tool, uh, which again, I'll, I do suggest you use it if, you, if at all possible, but if you can't, then this is where you'd fill out the adjusted gross income from your taxes. And it tells you exactly what line to look at on your taxes. So have your tax return handy if in fact you were not able to use the data retrieval tool. It's also gonna ask you to break down how much each parent earned from work. So this is wages. Um, for most people, um, the wages, if, when you add them together between the two people who filed the tax return, add up to the adjusted gross income. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't because you might have income from other sources, uh, interest income, for example, or um, business income, those types of things. So they won't be exact, but uh, this is where you have a chance to break it down between the two parents, if in fact two parents are involved here, uh, to show how much they earn from work in the 2019 year. Now, it's gonna ask you a series of questions and you'll see this thing is labeled as parent simplified path determination. And all that means is it's gonna ask you a series of questions that if you qualify will shorten 
the amount of information you have to provide on this form. And that's a good thing. If you can make this as short as possible is always a happy thing, right? So it's gonna ask you a series of questions. The first one, and it, it, this one would be filled out and you wouldn't even be asked this question if you use IRS data retrieval, but it's gonna ask if you filed taxes, if you also filed a schedule one, and you please read this very carefully when you're filling this out. Uh, but again, the tax returns have changed in the last couple of years. And so it's pretty easy to see whether or not, you know, in your paperwork, if you've kept copies of everything like you should, uh, whether you filed a schedule one. Um, so look for that and see if you did. If you did, mark yes. If not, put no. If you're not sure, you do have the option of putting don't know. And, and that's okay too. Um, and it's also going to ask you whether or not as of today, e if either of the parents that are filling out this FAFSA are considered a dislocated worker. You can click on that hyperlink and it will give you a really good definition of what's considered a dislocated worker. But in very broad terms, it'll be a parent that's unemployed um, and has not gone back to work uh, it, from that unemployment. But again, click on the link for a very precise definition of that. Also, it's gonna ask you whether or not if you, if the parent or anyone in their household is receiving one of these benefits, such as Medicaid, supplemental security in, income, which is generally disability income, um, supplemental nutrition assistance program or SNAP, uh, free or reduced lunches at school, uh, temporary assistance for needy families or TANF, um, special supplement nutrition program for women, infants and children or WIC, that's a very long name for WIC, but um, if in fact none of those apply to you or people that are in your household, then do mark none of the above and then click next to go to the next page. Uh, keep in mind this again, this is dynamic, just depending on how you've answered your questions, you may see all or, no, or some of these. All right, then into the parent. Uh, one more piece of information from your tax return and that is your income taxes paid. Please use the line that's indicated here. Uh, again, this is not tax, this is tax that you ended up paying to the IRS. So what that means is it's not the amount that you paid in necessarily, because oftentimes you get a refund, right? Um, it's gonna be the amount that they kept at the end of the day. So that's why I suggest you use that line. Be sure to use line 14 uh, minus schedule two, line two, if in fact you have a schedule two, to get this figure. Um, and then this is some questions that are just for tax filers. Uh, and this is trying to determine whether or not you have some income that was untaxed um, in addition to your taxable income that was on your tax return. So some of those things are, and I'm not gonna go into a great depth about each of these, but things like combat pay, if the parent is in the military, that's untaxed. Um, college, uh, student college grant and uh, scholarships reported on the IRS 1040. Uh, we can back that off of here so it's not counted twice towards the student's eligibility. Um, the educational opportunity uh, tax credit, untaxed IRA, all those questions. And if you'll see there for the last few, it's going to tell you exactly what line on your tax return to look for uh, to see whether or not you have any of those incomes. I will say that for most people, the answer to these is probably no. Uh, most of them are zero, so put a zero in there. Uh, the other thing I'll mention too is that as you're entering information about income, whether this is on the parent or the student side, do not list cents, all right? Because the Department of Education doesn't recognize uh, pennies when you list those. So for example, if, if you earned $5,250.50, just put the $5,250 or round up to $5,251 in that case. Otherwise, they're gonna think you, you made a lot more than that. Uh, so you don't want that to, to, to happen. They'll think you made $52,000, I believe. So uh, don't leave the pennies off on the end when you're reporting income. And it's also gonna ask you about some any additional fi uh, financial information that you might have. Again, most of these are zero in most cases, but uh, one that typically that might not be zero is child support that your parents paid. So if you, the parent, are filling out this FAFSA with your child and you had to pay child support to a different parent for a different child, 
then you could list that here so that we won't count that against uh, the, the student in the calculation for financial need. Um, but again, most of these are gonna be zero in most cases, but uh, be careful as you're reading through there. If that does uh, equate to something in your life, then you do need to answer that accurately. And we're gonna go next. And here's some more questions about parent untaxed income. And I'm not, again, I'm not gonna go into each one of these, but just read through them carefully. You'll see where it's gonna refer you to, to look for information about this. In, in many cases, the answer to these are zero. These are more unusual cases, I would say. But for example, like one of them is child support received for all children. Now that, that's for the 2019 year. So you might as a parent have received child support. So you will want to fill out this, this uh, box if in fact you did receive child support for the year. And it would be for the full year, not, not a monthly figure, but a full year. Or if in fact you receive housing, food or other living allowances, members of the military or the clergy might receive those. So this will apply to some people. So read through to see if these apply to you and answer as needed. All right, so here's another chance where you can might be able to shorten up part of this. It's gonna ask you if you want to skip the questions about your parents' assets. Uh, these are things that your parents own. Uh, so if it gives you this option, um, unless you're told otherwise, I generally recommend that you say, yes, I do want to skip the question. If you can't skip them, the question won't even come up. It'll just require you to fill it out. But if it gives you the option, you're certainly welcome to do so. Uh, and then it's gonna ask you about assets such as, as of today for the parent, what's the amount of your cash savings and checking? Um, it's gonna ask the net worth of your investments. It, let's say like real estate. Now, you don't count your own personal house that you live in, but if you owned a second home, then yes, you would count the, the net value of what that worth of, is, of that uh, other piece of real estate is. And then the last question, this again, this one's a fairly rare one because it's gonna ask you the net worth of your parent uh, business or investment farm, but it's only for those that have more than a hundred employees uh, in them. So if this is just a small business that you as the parent have, and you have less than 100 employees, you do not have to put the net worth here. Okay, so that wasn't so bad, right? So we got through the parent section and now we're turning our eyes to the student section. And again, you know that because you're, if you're watching the tab at the top of the screen, you'll always know where you are in the application process. And you can see right now, we are in the home stretch. So now we're gonna ask some very similar questions for the student. And for many students, if they are in high school, they maybe they didn't work or maybe they worked just a little bit, but it's, it is gonna ask if your child filed a tax return. And if they did, by all means, you would put that it is already completed, but if they did not, whether they worked or not, then you would put did not file when you use the drop down box for this question. If they did complete it, it's gonna ask the same questions that it asked the parent about taxes, um, how they filed and um, the status of their file. But just like the parent, you can also use the data retrieval tool to pull that information in from the IRS. Uh, so if, if they did file, again, it's an easy thing to pull that data in. And you'll see where it gives you the option to link to the IRS to do that. Again, if you choose not to, or for some reason, if you're not able to do the link for whatever reason, then you have the option of filling these questions in. Again, if you had a successful link to the IRS, this will not show up. You won't have this question. So it's gonna ask about adjusted gross income for the student. It's gonna ask how much they earn from wages. And it's gonna ask about their income tax. Uh, all the lines are provided here on the tax form in order to have to answer these accurately. This will look familiar again because the parent got these same questions. These are more unusual situations or untaxed income that a student might receive. If the answer is zero, by all means put a zero there. If not, put the correct answer and then next. And the same thing here about child support you paid. Again, for a student, um, this is probably gonna be not common. Now, the last question here about taxable earnings from need-based employment programs, that might become an issue if your child goes to college and becomes a federal work-study student. 
We talked about work study earlier, and we mentioned that you can work on campus or even off to earn a portion of your financial aid. Well, instead of making them count that income again on their from against them in a future financial aid application, listing in here will allow us to back it off. So if for the 2019 year, the child the student did have earnings on there that they submitted uh, for taxes that was income earned from federal work study, they would list this here and then next. Again, these are more uncommon, but you would answer these depending on the answer that is appropriate. Next. And it's gonna ask them also about information about their assets. Uh, if your child has their own checking or savings account or investments, that information would be listed here if it's in their name. If it's not in their name and it's actually in your name, the parent, it would go on the parent section. So don't, you don't have to report them in both sections, just report them once in the appropriate spot, depending on whose name is on it. So one of the last questions it asks is whether or not um, the person completing this FAFSA is a preparer. They are referring to a paid preparer. I uh, will uh, let you know, uh, I'm free. So right, I helped you fill out your FAFSA tonight. Uh, it didn't cost you a dime. And if you ask uh, your high school counselor or advisor, or you ask the college financial aid office for help, we will also not charge you for any assistance. But there are people out there that will charge you. And I would suggest you not do that. But if you were to, for some reason, pay someone to help you do this FAFSA, you would have to answer yes here and then answer some questions about that. All right, we are now at the summary section. So all the hard work is done at this point. All the information is listed and it's given you an opportunity to look through it to make sure what you listed was accurate. This is a good time to take a moment, look through it line by line and make sure that the answers to the questions make sense. If not, you can always go to the previous screen and make changes before you submit it. Of course, you can always make changes later too, but it's easier to do it now if you catch it right at this moment. And that's just a more of that summary and more of the what that looks like. And you do next. And we're at the point now where you're going to sign it. And this is where, again, where that FSA ID is going to come in handy. You're going to do this one at a time. The one on the left hand side is for the student, and the one on the right is for the parent. So start with the student, provide your signature. It's gonna ask them to read these terms of agreement before they answer uh, that they agree. And it's just, just basic information that, you know, I will use my financial aid in a responsible manner. I don't, I'm not in default on any previous financial aid, that type of stuff, so. All right, and then you click sign this FAFSA and that pulls in your FSA ID information. And now it's the parent's turn. You'll see now that the student says they have signed electronically. So they're golden now. So now we move on to the parent and they're gonna click on to provide parent signature. And it's either gonna be parent one or parent two that's signing, whoever has the FSA ID. If both have it, then you're gonna pick one or the other, but um, typically you only just need the one parent FSA ID to get through this process. They also have to sign some terms of agreement. And then it asks for the parent's FSA ID information here. Uh, quick note, they won't ask you this information if you were able to successfully use the IRS data retrieval tool. So that's kind of a nice little bonus. It makes it very simple and just skips right over the section. Uh, but if you didn't use it, it's gonna ask you to use your FSA ID here to sign it. All right, now the parent, if the parent for some reason is not able to use their FSA ID or they choose not to use it and would prefer to print a signature form, you have the option here. Um, if you're gonna sign electronically with your FSA ID, that's the first option. You can print a signature page, but be sure you've got a printer hooked up to your computer. If you're gonna print a signature page, you're gonna actually have to sign this with a, a wet signature, a pen, and it's gonna be mailed to the Department of Education and the address is on the form when you print it. And you can submit it without a signature, which I don't re recommend doing uh, because what will happen 
is they're going to hold it at the Department of Education for 14 days for you to submit the signature at a later time, which is fine. If you do within that 14 days, that's okay. Uh, but at the end of 14 days, if you have not submitted the parent signature, they're going to um, reject it. And what's going to become, they're going to send you what's called an invalid FAFSA result. Uh, and that won't be fixed until you do provide that parent signature. So it's just better to be prepared up front to have this ready. All right, now you'll see that it signs, says both student and parent have signed electronically. So success, success, success. And you then are here to the confirmation page. You have actually finished it. Make sure, and I'm gonna go back here one screen. Oops. You see where it says submit my FAFSA now? Be sure you click this box. You've signed it successfully, but if you do not click this box, you have not submitted your FAFSA. That's probably the most important box on this form. Uh, so make sure you click that, and then that's when you get this lovely confirmation page that tells you that they've completed it. Um, you'll notice at the bottom there on that left-hand side on the right, it says, does your brother or sister need to complete a FAFSA? This is where I mentioned early on that um, if you're having to fill out FAFSAs for multiple students that live in your household, your children, they're all going to college, and I'm sorry, I know that's a lot of money, but <laughs> uh, you have the option of doing another FAFSA by copying over your information. So you can click on this. Uh, if you fail to click it here, you can't go back to it later to do it. You would just have to start a new FAFSA for that brother or sister that's living at home, but that's not the end of the world. But this just is a nice kind of cool little feature they offer to make your life a little bit easier. Um, so again, uh, glad uh, we've gotten here to the end. This is what you wanna make sure to know that you've submitted it successfully is to get that confirmation page. And as you can see, we have now gone through line by line of the FAFSA for a dependent student. And I hope you'll, uh, you'll see that it really wasn't that overwhelming. It really wasn't that hard. Um, but that being said, there are always questions about a process that you're using for the first time. And so this is your time now to ask any questions that either I or some of the other experts that are on the phone might be able to answer. Um, and so I'm going to turn it back to our host, and so we can start a maybe a little short question and answer period. All right. Well, thank you again, Lisa. And there are several questions that have come in. Uh, one question is: What if my child doesn't have a social security number, but they have been trying to fill it out as a dependent, and they have a TIN, T-I-N number? Uh, what do they do then? For a student, that, that's a problem. The student has to have a social security number. Now, that's not true for the parent. Some parents will not have a social security number for a variety of reasons, mostly having to do with citizenship status. Uh, and in that case, on the parent section, you can fill out the social security number with all zeros for the parent. But for the student, the student has to have a social security number. If they don't have a social security number, they cannot submit the FAFSA and they are not eligible for any federal or state financial aid. Okay, thank you, Lisa. The other question is, my dad is in military and claim VA on taxes. We have lived in North Carolina for five years. Where do I claim residency? Oh, that goes into a residency Resident. question that gets kind of complicated. Um, for financial aid purposes, just for the FAFSA purposes, I'm not gonna talk about the Residency Determination Service. That's a whole other discussion and probably a whole other workshop about how yeah. tuition is charged in the state of North Carolina. But for financial aid purposes, it's okay on the FAFSA to list this pa the parent's state of residence as the one they filed their taxes in. Perfect. Um, if parent one is remarried, but separated, will you still need to report the soon to be ex step parents information? No, you will not. You okay. will not. If you list on the on the FAFSA as the parent uh, that you are separated, whether that's from the natural parent or from the stepfather, then it reverts back to you, the parent. And that's the only income that you will need to submit on the FAFSA. All right, perfect. The next question is, do you count 401ks, IRAs, and 529 plans in your asset section? Well, um, there are questions in the untaxed income section about the different types of those uh, types of income. Um, 
they vary widely. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to ask you to go and take a look at that help section, just because there's a lot of nuance in there uh, about the untaxed incomes and 401ks and things like that. Typically, we try not to count against parents or students any retirement income or retirement uh, savings. Um, we're trying to protect that. But I do want you to read that question very carefully, the help section, when you're filling out the FAFSA to see if you have any of those types of resources. All right. And I believe that is all the questions that we have. Um, and that's all the time we have, actually. So, Lisa, we thank you so much. Uh, Lisa is the financial aid director at Guilford Technical Community College, and she is a great community partner. Um, thank you to CFNC, Carolina College Advising Corps, and uh, Gifford Parent Academy, Gifford County Schools, and to all of our partners on the line today. Tequila is all you. All right. Um, like, um, like it was said, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I just want to um, remind you that uh, you, you can go to, I don't know if you said this, uh, Warshay, if you put in the chat, how they're able to access the recorded uh, video. But you are able to go to the Say Yes uh, Guilford um, YouTube channel and you're able to uh, see this uh, once again. And I um, want to invite you guys to be on the lookout for our next series. So we are busy at work already trying to put together our spring timeline for seniors and what juniors should be doing in order to get prepared for the senior year. So uh, stay on the lookout for our next webinar series. And I think that's all the time that we have. Thank you again for all of our community partners. We thank Lisa Kortoff once again. She is awesome. She did an amazing job. And so we can just give her a virtual hand clap. Um, so thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Have a great evening. All right. Thank you, everyone.